Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Glossica. And I'm excited to announce, as you can see here, I'm here with Ollie Richards, the founder of I Will Teach You a Language. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you. This is actually one of our first talks that we've ever had, so um, face to face. So, Ollie, why don't you uh, go ahead and give us a, a quick intro to um, you, your background, and uh, your interest in, in language in particular, and, and um, your service. Sure. Well, thanks, Matt. And you know, thanks for the for the invite. It's great to talk. We've been communicating for years, but it's the first time we've kind of been properly uh, face to face virtually even. Yeah, so my name is Oli. I'm from the UK and um, I have a, a background in a couple of things. Um, initially, I was a jazz musician, but that seems like a long time ago. Um, when I was uh, about 18, 19, I started learning languages and I got the language bug. And uh, so I spent a lot of my 20s learning lots and lots of different languages, much like you, Mike. Um, but one of the things I also did was um, I, I taught English for quite some time. I taught in Japan and in, in the Middle East. And I developed a real passion for teaching as well. So what I do now is I kind of combine my experience learning languages with my quite extensive experience teaching. And I, what I'm trying to do is to create um, a, a combination of those two, of those two things. And in particular, what I do is teach through stories. So I write books of stories, um, which are around the place find bookshops everywhere. I create um, online courses, which uh, are for beginners and intermediate levels, all based through the power of story. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. So what inspired you specifically to start the, this uh, story learning method? Sure. Yeah, so story learning has been one of those things that was decades in the making, but kind of crystallized in my mind uh, um, at, at one point. So the first time I ever discovered um, the power of stories and, and reading in particular was many years ago when I was actually traveling through Argentina and I was um, I was up in the in the in, in the mountains on the border of Argentina and, and and Bolivia and there was one night when I kind of woke up in the middle of the night and I couldn't breathe um, because of because of the altitude and so I was too scared to go back to bed because I was just yeah I couldn't breathe at all so I kind of reached for this Spanish book that I had and I sat up in the moonlight reading this Spanish book for about three or four hours. Uh, too scared to go back to bed. And it was really hard and I was really struggling because I wasn't very good at Spanish at this point. But the next day I realized that all these words had stuck in my head from this book that I'd read. I thought, wow, that's interesting because I'd been trying to learn Spanish the traditional way for quite some time. But through actually sitting down for a few hours and really reading, I found that it just unlocked all these different parts of my brain. What is your definition of the traditional way? So when I say the traditional way, I'm usually, it's usually a caricature of grammar translation methods. So this is what most people are used to at school. 99% okay. of people will have had, uh, you know, lessons with a teacher at the, at the blackboard, memorizing grammar rules, rote memorization of vocabulary. That's what happened to me at school. And I think okay. that's how a lot of people still, you know, still learn. So I, yeah, I, I, so I started reading more and more and more, and I just realized it was just this huge um, gateway into, um, into spending more time with the language. And I think this is ultimately the power of, of, of reading and of, and of stories in particular, which is that you can just do it anywhere, anytime. And once you get used to reading, it unlocks just limitless exposure to the language. And that really, once you, once you start to get that level of immersion, that's when you, know, you, you open the door of the wardrobe and walk out into Narnia and it's a completely different, different world. So th that, that's sort of the magic of, of the whole process is like you said you're like opening up the wardrobe door and walking into narnia what about what about from the the users that have been um using your stories have they have they also shared with you some of those experiences where um that, that kind of where that magic happens yeah and so often a lot of a lot of people that that, that that learn with us um they they come from this traditional learning background that i mentioned where they've they've tried um they, they've tried learning sometimes for you know 15 20 years learning in more traditional ways and when they, what I try to do with my, my books in particular is I try to give people the experience of actually reading something authentically in the language. And often people get that for the first time. So I'll often get people emailing me saying, hey, Ollie, I've just read your book in French or in, or in uh, Spanish or something. And I've, I, I've just, I can't describe how it feels to have read an entire story or an entire book in the language and that's a massive light bulb moment for people and i think a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, polyglots as well can remember the first book they ever read um in a foreign language i judging by the number of books you've got on your bookcase Mike, i don't know if you can remember the first book you ever read in chinese but um 
but I, I remember <laughs> I remember the first well, books I do I have these old story books. The stories right. really go a long way for learning the language. Um, uh, 中国历史故事, there's a Chinese historical stories. I mean, there's a lot of history from China. So these are watered down, easy version stories. And these are really, really, I mean, yeah, I, I used story learning as a way to pick up Chinese as well. And, but I think in, more importantly was um, being able to paraphrase that story and put it in your own words after having read it in the vocabulary and learned the, the storyline. I think that, that that process of going back and retelling the story. And some of these I memorized and some of them I just tried to retell. And I felt that that was a really, really powerful yeah. uh, way. There are a lot of um, classroom-based um, story approaches which act where you've got where you can have that live interaction with teachers where you can facilitate a lot of that stuff you're talking about so you have a you know a story can be the teacher can tell a story the students can um can can can, can listen and assimilate it and then you can do all kinds of activities like retelling the story um and uh and and reacting and responding to the story which is a very important human element to the, um, to the learning process so that's not we don't go to quite that length because that that kind of length because we focus more on the self-study side of things but uh, yeah, but, this, but the thing about stories is that stories are just the oldest form of communication, right? We all grow up with yeah. stories. We communicate through stories. And so when you're learning through stories and what we try to promote with the story learning method is we're trying to tap in to this, 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 this human experience, this shared human experience, which we have across all languages and cultures of stories. And by doing that, you're kind of, you're, you're speaking a common language, even without, even before you have the words and the, and, and the grammar. So how does how does a new learner of a language get started with this uh, story learning method? Yeah. Or do they need question. to have a certain amount? Yeah, great, great question. So what we focus on actually is this kind of zero beginner um, level. We were speaking a little bit about um, this and in the interview that we did with you on, on my channel earlier about the, the challenge of particular methods, how those methods kind of port across the different levels of language learning, because, you know, generally, you don't do the same thing as an intermediate learner as you do as a as a beginner. It's two different sets of challenges. But our speciality really is um, for catering to beginners, and you know that range from complete beginner to intermediate level. So, what I do with story learning is I, I say to you right right from the word go, I want you immersed in the language as much as possible. I want you reading and listening. And so the the mechanism for that is we create comprehensible input. Um, for kind of zero beginner level. So across all the language, we do this in all, across all the languages from like from Japanese to, to Spanish. So the engine of our courses will be stories which are written for complete beginners. Now, obviously as a complete beginner, the question is, well, how do I understand any of this story if I don't know any of the words yet? And so what I do is I kind of add on top of that um, a kind of element of, of, uh, of tuition and guided discovery. So essentially what you'll do is you'll come in and on day one, you'll read through this very, through chapter one of a very simple story in the language, which is written with, you know, lots of repetition, um, very restricted amounts of, of vocabulary. And then you'll, you'll read it and then you'll listen to it and you'll do it over and over. And then what I do is I have um, videos where I come in and I kind of walk you through the story and point things out. So you see, you see that word there, you see that grammar there, you see that sentence here. And I, and I piece it together bit by bit. So you're reading and immersing first and then taking lessons which help you notice and raise awareness of your different of different elements of the language. And then over the course of the program, you, 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 you grow your vocabulary, you understand how the grammar works. But most importantly, what you get is lots and lots of time spent with the language. By the end of the program, you've actually read an entire book in the language, albeit a very simple one. So I'm trying to foster this habit of reading right from the start. That sounds like a really big challenge. How do you come up with the storylines? Because I mean, just to find content developers, I mean, we work on content, um, but probably not at the degree where you have to keep a concise yeah. you know, storyline. You have to keep your vocabulary at a certain level. There must be a, a lot of research that goes into this beforehand. And that, that's a, the first half of my question. The second half of my question is, um, do all of these storylines have like similar characters that reappear and and have some sort of like a, a, a larger arc storyline? Because I think that that sounds like a fascinating yeah. way to go with. This. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the second part of it first. This is something we're doing a lot of right now because we have um, right now. It, what, 
we have so many different books and courses and challenges and things like that that we're actively working on um, characters kind of reappearing um, from one series to the next. This is something that we didn't do at the beginning. I, I, when I first started all of this, I just didn't know where it was going to go. Right? So I wasn't thinking that far ahead. But now we're, we're spending, we're, we're doing quite a lot of work in, um, in actually having overarching storylines, you know, across across different books and courses and things like that. And that's great wow. for continuity in the minds of the of the of the readers. Um, but yeah, in terms yeah. of the so your, your the first half of the question was about the structural syllabus, basically of of, of the of, of the courses. So there's a couple of elements to this. So first of all, I mean, how do you how do you write an interesting story? I mean, that's a kind of a timeless timeless question. I, I, um, we we go through lots of different ideas and lots of different variations, but the stories are pretty simple in general. I mean, and, and we, we follow a very simple story arc. Obviously at, at the complete beginner level, the, you know, it's not, um, it's not Stephen King, you know, you're not, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not um, high literature or anything. So there's simple stories, they have to be. When we start to produce the courses, what we do is we actually take a, we wanna make sure we had two things, right? We wanna make sure that it's written at a level which, um, can facilitate teaching at that A1 level. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we cover the appropriate range of, um, of, uh, of the structural parts of the language. So what, the way that I actually begin when I'm creating these courses I'll, is I'll take a fairly standard structural syllabus. So I'll look at, okay, at the A1 level, what are the different buckets that we want to cover? We wanna make sure we give you an awareness of basic um, verb structure or basic verb conjugation oh, of um, articles and things like that. And then with that, what we'll do is we'll create stories which contain all of those different elements um, so that we've got the kind of, we've got, we've got the story that contains everything you need. And then the, what the teaching is all about is about kind of drawing your attention towards those things and raising awareness of the, of the different, um, of, of those key um, elements of the language. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of work in the preparation. So how large is your team then? Uh, we have about 10 people full-time and then dozens of freelancers. Um, who work on different different projects wow so yeah you i mean the business sounds like it's growing there's a, a lot of a lot more interest in um in all of the work that you know the, it's a it's a huge creative work creative job that you're, you're, do, that you're yeah, doing yeah one so. of one of the um one, one of the real um one of the so we, we partnered with teach yourself a few years ago when we started to release the uh, the books of uh our books of uh, of short stories and um this was a big a big Kind of moment in the development of the business because th these books then got into bookshops and teach yourself have done a fantastic job of actually expanding into different languages um so you know we have now we have languages like icelandic and turkish and korean and um, where, where where before that was never something we could do so we've managed to reach a, a far wider audience and, and have a lot more kind of i think name recognition um as a result of that so that's been that's been great but yeah we're generally we're just finding that the concept of story learning is just really resonating with people and people really like the idea of learning in a way which is which is which just which is just fun and, and makes makes sense based on on um on stories you know well what are some of the challenges you face in actually uh reaching a broader market with this i mean it sounds great that you have uh, partnered with a, a large publisher in that sense but is is there something else that you're looking at um doing yeah so one of the things we're, we're, we're experimenting a lot with at the moment is um different um different content platforms using stories so you know i, I began my blog back in 2013 um i will teach you a language.com um which is actually about to change to storylearning.com and so depending on when we publish this, it may or may not be storylearning.com by that point, um, which was not an easy domain to get, I'll tell you that. Um, so I, because I had always done a, lo a lot of blogging and to a certain extent, YouTube videos as well, we'd always had quite a lot of people coming to the website. So in the early days, I was able to just, um, uh, you know, experiment with these courses and books, and then my existing audience would try them out and give me feedback. What we're doing now is... Um, uh, now that we have a lot of these books and courses, we're thinking, well, how can we actually um, expand this more, more broadly? Because I always like to have lots of free content, right? And so we're thinking, okay, well, what does a story-based podcast look like? What does a story-based YouTube channel look like? And so last year, for example, we launched the Story Learning Spanish podcast, which is a, a daily immersion podcast um, for intermediate Spanish learners. And that's been fantastically popular. And, um, and it's reaching a brand new audience because the people who kind of search for podcasts on Spotify or, or iTunes are not the same people generally who look on YouTube or come to my website. So um, 
yeah, the kind of long-term vision really is how do we how do we take this concept of story learning and and make it available in as many different languages as possible and as many different places as possible, while also adapting that format to be appropriate to whatever platform you you are you are on because it is a different challenge. You know, when when you move from a book to a podcast to a course, you've got to treat it differently. And um, so yeah, that's a, a multi, many many years project, I think. So a burning question that I have is. Are, are any of the stories, like like you said, you had stories in Japanese, are they specific to Japanese culture? Or are these stories things that um, that you might have a Spanish version and then later you also repurpose it for, for learning Japanese? Um, do you use the same content or do you write specifically for that? Like you mentioned Icelandic. Yeah. Wow, Icelandic's got uh, a history of the, the saga or the sogur, if you're speaking Icelandic. Um, okay, okay, so there's just all of this, um, this great wealth of... Um, of storylines, so, so I mean, you're you're developing new stories that fit that that culture, or yeah. So, so generally, curious. generally, what we do is, I mean, from from a practical perspective, we we can't write brand new sets of stories for each language. Um, so what we what we tend to do is, the root or base story is a a, a storyline which you would get in in any in any language. You've got the hero's journey, um, for example. Yeah. Now, this is this is something which you're going to find. Uh, equally in a Chinese story as in a, a Brazilian story. Um, and then this, we write these stories in a fairly timeless way. And then we go through a fairly extensive process of, of adapting and I like to call it localizing stories to different, to different cultures. So for example, um, in, in a story where the, um, where the character or the characters would go to a, um, a, an old castle in Spain, if the story takes place in in Japan they don't go to a, to a castle they go to a to a shrine or to a temple um, or something like that so we we oh, okay. we we localize we localize them to different to different places but we but we we generally don't write uh, like completely unique original stories because it that just would for every language we do it would just double the complexity of the entire business which is a unfortunately a kind of a commercial decision that is a, is a necessary evil. Sounds like you've got quite a business hat as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've had to learn that as I go along. I think the main the, the main advantage that I've had doing all this is my my teaching background. So because I spent so many years teaching and I really got into, heavily into teaching as well and did kind of diplomas and master's degrees in teaching and linguistics and things like that. I've always had quite strong feelings about how, about wanting to, to teach and I think for a lot for a lot of people who, who do stuff online with languages, that they're, they're primarily learners, and it can be difficult to know if, as if you've never taught, it can be difficult to kind of bridge that gap from learning to then teaching and helping others. But I've always found that the fact that I've had a lot of experience teaching has been really helpful because I've I've generally had a kind of minimum baseline of kind of competence in terms of teaching stuff, which has meant that stuff has worked quite well from the beginning. And um, and I've also found that you know. I, for example, in my books, I write chapters about, you know, how to learn by reading, how to read effectively. And this is just like the, the teacher in me kind of just doing a massive brain dump. But they, those, those chapters have actually been some of the most um, useful uh, things for readers. And I often get emails from people saying, you know, I really, that, that, you know, the introduction to that book was so useful because no one's ever told me how to read before. And it sounds obvious, but actually, you know, it's it's not at all obvious how to read effectively in a foreign language because we don't bring our complete set of reading skills that we have in our mother tongue across to the second language. We don't do things like like uh, like like skimming and, um, and 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 guessing and predicting. We you know when we read in a foreign language, we start on word one and we read one word at a time. Wow, that's that's really fascinating. That um, so it's not in, my, in not in my list of questions, but I'm going to throw you a different kind of a question here. So. Uh, it, it sounds like you as an individual, you're quite academic in, in certain respects, but would you say that you're more of an entrepreneur and less of an academic or the other way around? That's an interesting it question. Like you've come a long way with business um, uh, acumen. <laughs> it, it's, see, so in my life, I tend to work in five to seven year periods, during which time I will just totally move on to something different. So, for example, when I was, uh, you know, a teenager and early twenties, I was re really into jazz. I did a degree in jazz piano. Music was my life. I wanted to be the best pianist in the world. 
eventually after like five to seven years, I, I, I ended up, my interests switched to languages and I spent the best part of my twenties kind of learning different languages and then, and then traveling. And then I wanted to travel more. So I got into teaching and then I spent about five years um, or more, maybe about five years kind of teaching and learning teaching. And then my life changed again. I came back to the UK and I, and I decided, right, I want to do something with languages. So I, I kind of started the, the, my, my, my business and then had to learn, right now I have to learn about business to see how, how I can actually grow this thing and reach more people and help more people and, you know, do better work. So I, I kind of, I mean, but you know, my knowledge of music and my memory of music and of languages is just as fresh now as it was when I was, when I was 20. I think when you, a bit like languages, you know, if you kind of, I always say, if you get your, if you're learning a language and you get it to a B2 level, an upper intermediate level, you never forget it after that. Um, yeah. If you get it to a B, B1 and below, you can forget it, but B, B2 and above, you won't forget it. I, I, I found that if you kind of do some, if you dedicate five years of your life to learning a skill, mm -hmm. Or learning a particular subject matter to a very high level you've got that then for life because five years is a, is a long time to be really focused on something and i tend to go all in on things so when i learn teaching i really learn teaching and it's just sort of the same thing with business so i kind of feel like um a lot of my a lot of what's what i've been able to do quite well is to is to take these different elements of my my you know i'm i'm far from the most experienced polyglot in the world i mean i you know far from it but i've got enough experience learning languages to make it useful and so to kind of combine that with the the teaching and then and, and the business it's uh, it's been a it's been a, a good a good mix okay so you've got you've got the uh the jazz music um big challenge in your life and then you had the teaching another challenge in your life and now you're running a business a new challenge what do you think is the next biggest challenge in your life this is a this is man if i could answer that question i'd be a different person i don't know um i i don't i really don't know I, I mean, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing, but I also do have this kind of, this kind of, um, I'm, I'm always searching, you know, I've actually found it recently. I found a big pull back to languages, you know, I, for, for a lot of the, um, the last, last five or so years, I, I haven't done a great deal of language learning because I've been working very hard on the business. I've got a young family and that's taken up a lot of my, a lot of my time and attention, but I've recently been really feeling the pull to go back to, to languages, especially languages like, like Cantonese and Japanese that I've got to a, an okay level, but not really good enough. And I need to do a lot more work. Um, and I've been feeling that, that drive coming back. You know, I've often, I've often felt like uh, to learning Chinese characters, for example, learning to read Chinese. I never did that. I did it a little bit, never got, never taken it oh, seriously. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I learned to speak Cantonese just, just purely spoken, which suited my needs at the time. But again, it's just an unfinished project basically. So I kind of feel like I have certain things that I know I want to be able to do at some point in my life and to learn to, to, to read Chinese is something which I mean, I'm nowhere with, but I, I wouldn't like to think that I would end my life without having learned to read Chinese. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you. Um, I, you know, this has been a really enjoyable uh, conversation Likewise. and, um, and I hope that um, all of our, our viewers will have a chance to go over and check out uh, your platform. So thank you everybody for listening and um, Stay tuned for more interviews. Bye-bye. Cheers, Mike. Thanks, everyone.